Um, okay, we're getting going here. So welcome everyone to this special author event, spotlighting the book Emperors of the Deep by Bill McKeever. Bill is here today and we're so glad and appreciative of him taking the time out of his busy schedule and adjusting uh, across the continent, uh, three time zones away. So welcome, Bill. Um, before we get into um, your presentation, I would like to take a moment to do a brief introduction with the land acknowledgement for the college. So this is the college's official land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge that the LW Tech campus is on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, past and present, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Coast Salish, the Stillaguamish, the Snoqualmie, the Muckleshoot, and the Duwamish tribes. We acknowledge these tribes by showing respect and take an intentional step toward correcting the stories and practices that erase Indigenous peoples' history and culture and toward inviting and honoring the truth. Because we're all coming from different places today, being um, online, I invite you to go to the link that I'm putting in the chat, native-land.ca, which is a map platform that will connect you to the land that you are on, and you can learn about the people whose land you are on. So thank you for taking a moment and um, participating in that land acknowledgement with me today. I also want to just mention that this event is organized by the LW Tech Library. You probably already know that uh, because I am the one that sent out the invitation today. My name is Greg Bem. I am one of the faculty librarians and the current library coordinator at the college. I'm very grateful that we're still able to provide programming like this even though it is a pandemic and we're all fully remote. Um, that being said, we are excited to do an announcement today that we will be physically reopening this summer. And hopefully with that reopening, we will have more programs, perhaps not of this nature right away uh, with COVID in mind, but we will have more programs down the road. There is a light at the end of the tunnel um, for all of our great cultural events that happen at the college. So with that being said, I'd like to kick off the uh, program tonight by introducing Bill. As I mentioned, Bill is the, Bill McKeever, who's here today, is the author of Emperors of the Deep. And as per HarperCollins description, in this remarkable groundbreaking book, a documentarian and conservationist determined to dispel misplaced fear and correct common misconceptions, explores in depth the secret lives of sharks, magnificent creatures who play an integral part in maintaining the health of the world's oceans and ultimately the planet. Bill McKeever is an author and documentary filmmaker. His book, Emperors of the Deep, is in bookstores and focuses on raising awareness to the plight of sharks and makes a great call for action to save them. And Greenpeace calls the book a must read. I have not yet read the book, but I am excited to announce the book is available in the LW Tech Library. And I'm going to put the link to the record of the book in the chat if you are interested in learning a little bit more. I'm also going to put a link into the chat with um, uh, to the, the book's website. So you can check out uh, the book in more depth there. With that being said, if you have any questions or comments tonight, if you have anything to um, ask Bill directly, we have a small but mighty group here and Bill has agreed to answer questions um, as needed at the end of the presentation. So please throw them into the, into the chat and we'll get, get to them. I'll make sure that they get answered um, or at least there's an opportunity for them to get answered at the end. Uh, Bill, I think that's everything. So I uh, welcome everyone uh, to Bill and Bill, it's all yours. Okay, great, Greg. Thank you for that. And welcome everyone. And it, and uh, with uh, summer fast approaching, I thought this would be a good time to step back and, and take a look at sharks. I have found as I've gone around the country on my book tour that I run into a lot of people who 
are frankly nervous about going swimming in the ocean. And I'm here to tell everyone that on your vacation, that you shouldn't be wasting the psychic energy thinking about a shark attack. It is uh, incredibly remote as uh, I'll go into the, the statistics and the ocean is one of life's great gifts and something that we should be enjoying whenever we have the opportunity. So tonight I'm gonna give a summary of my book, Emperors of the Deep, as well as the film of the same name. And uh, the film has been at several festivals. It's currently playing right now at the International Ocean Film Festival virtually in San Francisco. And you can watch it there. And uh, of course the book is available in, in bookstores across the country, as well as available on Amazon. And uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm gonna pull that up right now. And um, with that, let me get that going. So uh, what I'd like to do is um, tell you um, a bit about my story and how I got involved. And uh, then I'm also gonna talk about the latest shark discoveries. There, this has been a golden age in shark research and not that you wake up in the morning in the shower and, and think about that. But there has been a remarkable advance in our knowledge about sharks, which is actually very good news. And uh, I also wanna talk something that's I think very important. And that is that sharks are crucial to the marine ecosystem. You know, I can remember as a kid, people thought that uh, sharks were a nuisance. Uh, they were dangerous, we were better off without them. And now we know that that view was absolutely wrong. Um, I got started in this when I went to a shark tournament in Montauk. Montauk is the Eastern end of Long Island where, where I live. I live in, in New York City. And every summer they have these shark tournament events where fishermen go out to catch sharks. And this is a clip uh, from my film, Emperors of the Deep. I'm just going to give a quick sample about this uh, issue with the tournaments. This is a Mako shark only tournament. This apex predator can grow to over a thousand pounds and yet it can sprint 45 miles an hour. Anglers like to catch Makos, which bite hard and they can leave 20 to 30 feet in the air. This is no sporting game for the shark. He is in a desperate fight for his life. You want to miss? The shark is hooked, and now the life and death struggle begins. Powerful engines with thousands of horsepower take on sharks weighing as little as 125 pounds. The battles can last one to two hours. stop the film here because it gets very graphic and, and I don't want to dwell on that, but these are actually barbaric events and I'm on a mission to put an end to these uh, shark tournaments that are totally un unnecessary. Um, and, and I think that if you step back, which we're going to uh, do now, and look at the shark from a rational perspective, well, I, I want to people to go away with this idea that sharks are not man-eaters, they're not dangerous, uh, obviously you have to be respectful of them, but they're, they're not looking or hunting for us. And uh, they play, that, again, that crucial role in, in the uh, environment. Now, I did mention that uh, scientists have uh, learned a great deal about sharks. And uh, what I want to do is uh, show you a clip about a thresher shark. Thresher sharks are beautiful sharks to me. They have 
a tail that's just about uh, half the length of their body. And scientists were perplexed why they had such a long tail. Well, someone with an underwater camera was able to find something that had never been seen before. And this just happened 12 months ago. So I'm gonna play this uh, video about a thresher shark. You can see the, the beautiful long tail that he has. And you can see what he's doing. He's running into bait fish and he's whipping his tail as, as a weapon. This is the only animal in the ocean. And in fact, I think you can include land animals that, that hunt with its tail. And we are now just uh, learning about uh, this animal and that it, it does this, never known before. Uh, a hammerhead shark, a beautiful shark. And of course, people wondered why do they have such a, a, a strange head? Why are the eyes perched on the end? And they did some computer modeling and, and some studies and they determined that a hammerhead shark actually has 360 degree panoramic view of its environment. And also embedded in that head is an incredible ability to sense very tiny electrical fields. So as they're swimming over the sand, they can detect animals that are actually buried in the sand. Now see that beautiful dorsal fin? That's one of the biggest dorsal fins in the shark world. That acts like a sail and the hammerhead will swim on its side so it can get additional lift. That improves efficiency by about 10%. This is a female shark. You can see it's been raked by a male in a mating event. Uh, female sharks have skin three times as thick as males so they can uh, withstand these uh, mating encounters. So they're okay, but it can get, uh, they, they can get marked up quite a bit. We're also discovering a new species of sharks. When I was doing some research about uh, sharks, I read a book that came out about 30 years ago and they said there are uh, 250 species of sharks. Well, since that time, they kept, kept on discovering species. And now we know there are over 500 species of sharks. And they are found all over the world from the Arctic to Antarctica, in between cold water, uh, warm water, et cetera. This is an underwater view of a new shark that was discovered in Indonesia. It looks like a bad Halloween costume. And uh, these, this species was never uh, known before. This is a video of a shark. It's called an epaulet shark. And uh, they actually get out of the water and walk on top of the reef. This, this shark is not in the water. And what they do is that uh, at low tide, they come out and they hunt for worms and small crustaceans. Uh, we had no idea that epaulet sharks existed and they actually could, could walk uh, out of, of the water. Um, and we're also learning about even the big sharks, the great white sharks, uh, of course, from uh, Jaws fame. And we are learning that they're just like us. They have a very long gestation period. In fact, uh, one that's longer than human, they have very few uh, births, may, typically two, maybe four. And they have a very long uh, developmental period for the first seven years of their life. They're kind of like toddlers. They can only eat small fish. And then as they grow and they mature, um, then they can go after bigger prey, which are marine uh, mammals. And they can also live to be very old. Uh, great whites can live as long as uh, 75 years and longer. But of course, their big uh, prey item are seals. And you may ask why. It's a very simple answer. And that's because seals have blubber and that very fat rich material has a lot of energy. And the sharks use that to recharge their liver. Their liver is as much as a third of their body weight. And that's kind of like their battery, if you will, that gives them the energy for the great travels that they make uh, in throughout their life. Uh, again, from the, from the uh, film, here's a, 
a clip about great whites in South Africa hunting seals. The seal, the great white shark's favorite meal. Now, um, now th those those great white sharks. Uh, it takes them years to perfect the ability to, uh, to to capture seals and make a living out of it. Um, and then the other thing that that we've learned about these great white sharks is that they are uh, there can actually be social. Uh, this is a photograph from uh, a, a photographer in New Zealand that captured a couple of sharks called the brothers. These two guys hang out together. You can see this is very unusual because the shark at the top is fully exposed and the shark at, at the bottom could obviously inflict significant damage. But again, they are uh, socializing together. And scientists have found other species of sharks that socialize. socialize. Uh, blue sharks apparently can hunt in packs. That was never uh, known before, and lemon sharks in mangroves actually pair bond with lemon sharks of a similar size and sex. And uh, one scientist uh, set up a, a station in the mangroves and he would see these sharks pair up. And when uh, high tide came in and, and a lot of predators came in, the lemon sharks would actually go hide together. And then when the tide uh, went out, they would reemerge. And they have these relationships that uh, last for years. So uh, Flipper is not the only one that has uh, a social life. Well, so if you look at all these things, and, and I've got a lot more in the book about what we've learned about tiger sharks and great whites and hammerheads, uh, and the list goes on. But of course, we got to come back to uh, the, the view that a lot of people have is that, of course, sharks are out there uh, wanting to uh, have us for a meal. And uh, so here's, let's, let's kind of uh, parse that a bit. And here's a graph that shows the number of attacks. And they have gone up to every decade in the last uh, century. And there's a very simple reason for this which is that the human population continues to grow and more people have uh, disposable income. So they go to the beach, they go in the water where they have an, uh, the potential for an encounter with a shark. It's that simple. More people means uh, in the water means more shark attacks. And if you look at uh, this, this clip, you'll see a bull shark swimming um, along the coast and uh, the recent study came out that great white sharks spend about half of their time in water that's a depth of uh, less than 15 feet. And the reason that they're coming into these shallow waters is that they're trying to make a living. They're looking for prey. They are not looking for us as some episodes in Shark Week uh, would, would have you believe. And uh, so here's a video of a, of a bull shark uh, in, in the water. And what typically has happened, and I have some other video, is if they do encounter a human, uh, they do typically uh, swim away. And you can see they're very graceful animals and they have tremendous eyesight. So they, believe me, they can see us before they, they, uh, we see them. And if there were, uh, if they really were after us, considering the millions of people who go swimming every year, we would have a lot more incidences. Well, let, let's let's talk about that. Of course, uh, of the 500 species, the the bigger ones are the sharks that we have to to think about: the great white, the tiger, and the bull shark. Uh, very unusual for any other species to uh, to uh, attack. And uh, of course, the great white is uh, the one that's uh, the most famous. 
I thought it'd be interesting to listen to a surfer who would att was attacked South Africa by a shark. It's the third highest number of shark attacks in the world. Many of them by great whites. My name's Joseph Kroner. I'm from Mossel Bay, South Africa. I've surfed most of my life since I was five years old. Um, and I was attacked by a shark, great white. I had been surfing for a while, had a few waves, and I was busy paddling. And I was halfway up and just decided to have a rest. So I, I put both my arms up on the board and was just sort of lying, lying flat on the board. Well, that's when it happened. And it came from behind. So I just slowly felt myself lifting up. Um, and then my mind sort of blanks out. I remember when I came up out the water, I looked straight at it swimming away from me. And that was probably the most hectic part, just to see the intensity of the animal. I just saw white water and the board. I could see the board sticking out on either side. So at that stage, it was probably broken because it was sticking out at an angle. Out of the shark's mouth? Out of its mouth, yeah. So this is the piece that the great white bit out of my surfboard. Um, you can obviously see the shape of its mouth and you can get an indication of the size. I think they would have worked out the size at three and a half meters, just from the sort of the size of the bite. Yeah, have a look. So the, the teeth marks are here. <laughs> yeah, the good shot. Uh, sea sharks is sort of beautiful animals. I've only got more respect for them because of the attack. They're very graceful and mostly peaceful. So I see them with a lot of respect and and awe. So yeah, and and I and I thought this was instructive because you know here's someone who was attacked by white. He he has no anger towards them. And uh, he was clearly exposed. If the shark was interested in him, it would be a very different outcome. To the shark that's swimming along, um, sometimes they can confuse an object in the water with their prey item, which is a, a seal or a, or a purpose or, or, a, or, or a turtle. And, um, and if you step back and, and look at the, the number of attacks, this is actually quite interesting. So uh, this is the data for the last uh, a, a full year we have, and uh, most of the attacks take place in the United States, fully three quarters, then the rest are in Australia, and then after that it falls off dramatically. So the United States is, uh, is ground zero. And uh, the reason is, if you look into the states, you'll see that uh, the states that have a lot of surfers, like Florida and Hawaii, have most of the attacks. And over half of the attacks in the United States take place in, in Florida. And again, it falls off dramatically uh, after that. Where I live in, in New York and, and New Jersey, there's sharks that are out there, but there's not much surfing. So there's very few uh, attacks. And then if you look at the activity, uh, almost uh, two thirds of the activity that involves a, an attack is, is surfing. Again, that, that activity is creating noise, the splashing, it look, the surfboard looks like uh, a, a turtle, and that creates activity that's interesting to the shark. And then swimming, people that are kicking, making a lot of noise, splashing, uh, that's also going to get attention. People who are just calmly swimming, uh, very rarely for anything uh, to happen to them. Now, what's interesting is that if you would listen to the media, and you would look at uh, Shark Week, you would think that the attacks are out of control. Uh, the reality is, is that shark attacks are, are down uh, three years in a row. In the United States, the five-year average is 55. And now in the most recent year, 2020, we were at uh, 33. And uh, unusual year in 2020 because of what happened in uh, Cape Cod. But typically, we have less than uh, half a person's death per year. Uh, and uh, again, that shows you really uh, how rare it is to have an, a, an, an event like this. 
Now, the principal uh, shark involved in the shark attacks, I really don't like using that word because they're really more, I think, descriptive to say shark bites because that's about the, the severity of an encounter, uh, a bite like a, like a big dog and then the shark swims away. Very rarely do they ever come back for, for a second bite. And uh, these black tip sharks uh, uh, migrate uh, from the Carolinas down to Florida. So in the summertime, they like to hang out in North Carolina and then they're like us. They like to go south to warmer waters and they go all the way down to Miami and uh, the Keys. Uh, well, with ocean warming, that has changed, uh, of course, the temperatures. So the sharks don't have to swim as far south to get that warm water that they like, about 72 degrees. So what's happening, the migration is shifting. So they're, they're still going south in the wintertime, but they're stopping in the upper part of Florida around Jacksonville. They're not getting into the areas where the surfers are. So without the sharks being there, number of attacks are down. Interestingly enough, during the summer months, they have to find, again, that ideal water temperature. So they like to go a little farther north. But now with global warming, they have to come all the way up into the uh, New York and uh, Providence, Rhode Island area uh, to find that temperature. So. I, there are more black tips around here, but again, there are not a lot of surfers, so there's been no change in the number of attacks. Now, this uh, change in ocean temperature is putting a stress on sharks because now they have to travel almost an extra thousand miles to find the water temperature that they like. And of course, that puts them at risk to being caught by commercial fishermen, it also means that they have to get more energy, so they need more, more food. And, um, and as the water temperatures have risen, we also have the twin impact of ocean acidification. Ocean acidification just means that the ocean is taking all that carbon out of the atmosphere. It's actually helping to, to keep the planet cool. And, uh, but as a result, all that carbon makes it more acid in the water. And that makes it more difficult for sharks to be able to smell their prey. It's kind of like us uh, going out on a city street with a lot of traffic, smelling all those fumes. Um, so we're seeing the environment becoming more stressful for sharks. They have to travel farther and, and, and they have to get, a, a, you know, to struggle to get more food. And uh, I mentioned black tips. I obviously wish I had more time, but I can go into other examples around the world where shark migration patterns are taking place. For example, uh, in South Africa, the black tip sharks there have moved south and uh, they're running into the tiger sharks. And now the tiger and the black tip sharks are all competing for food. And uh, it's just creating a, a stress on, uh, on both species. But again, uh, I'll leave it to the book for those that, that want more detail. Now, of course, I wanna spend a little time about uh, these shark bites and, and what can be done about it? Because I think, we, I think we can take action to minimize the risk. And uh, one, uh, any encounter or any death is obviously one too many. And let me just on the right side, talk about what can be done. Uh, number one is dr use of drones. Australia has been the leader in this area. And uh, the drones will go out, they go along the beach, uh, they spot a shark, they alert the lifeguard, they get everybody out of the water. And when the shark goes by, they let everybody back in. That's been a very successful program. In uh, South Africa, they have something called shark spotters, where they have lifeguards sitting on a hill or on a very high precipice and uh, looking for sharks, they do the same thing. Uh, some people have come up with uh, a sea snake wetsuit. And what this does is to uh, throw the shark a little bit off balance because sea snakes are poisonous, all sea snakes. And sharks know this, so they give a wide berth to sea snakes. So the wetsuit has the alternating look of a sea snake. It's got 
a, a black band followed by a white band going all over the wetsuit. So the shark gives it a wide berth. And uh, they're doing some more research on this, but this has been very encouraging. So I think when we uh, are, you know, are thoughtful about this and uh, just be respectful, let the sharks have their ocean, we're interlopers, that uh, we can uh, share the ocean with them. The one thing that we don't want is culling sharks or catching them in nets that kill them or drum lines, which are basically giant hooks that, that kill the sharks because sharks travel a lot. And uh, if a shark did uh, nip someone, that shark is probably long gone by the next day and another shark comes in. So killing that other shark doesn't really do, do any good. So that's something that I've, that I've been focused on in, in my work is to raise, raise uh, awareness about that. Now, um, again, this is very important that we all rec society recognizes that sharks are crucial to the marine ecosystem. Just to give you a, a quick sample, some of you may be familiar with what happened in uh, Yellowstone when they took the wolves out and they wanted to create a hunter's paradise so that hunters could come in, not have to compete with wolves to catch deer. And when they took the wolves out, it was an ecological disaster. Uh, the rivers actually started to flow in a different way. The riverbanks lost uh, their, their strength. And so they brought the wolves back and it had immediate impact. Well, you do the same thing in the ocean and take the sharks out as apex predators, you will devastate that marine ecosystem. And that's true in every marine ecosystem, whether it's seagrass or coral reefs or the open ocean. And now, again, I don't have time. I do talk about this in the book, but I wanna focus uh, just in one area on seagrass. This was a study done by uh, Dr. Heithouse who worked in Shark Bay in Australia. And again, here's a clip from the movie about uh, this issue. So we've been working on tiger sharks in a seagrass ecosystem of Western Australia that looks a lot like seagrass should have all around the world, maybe centuries ago before people started affecting these systems. And what we've been trying to figure out is what would happen if we lost tiger sharks. Why we wanna know this is that seagrasses are really important for lots of reasons. First and foremost, they provide food and habitat for small fish, shrimps, crabs. They grow up to be important in food webs, but are also species that people want to catch and eat. And so we need to make sure we're protecting seagrass ecosystems for that reason. But it also turns out that they're important for climate change because they store a lot of carbon dioxide. The seagrass pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, builds up more seagrass, and then when that seagrass dies, it gets buried. So it's kind of sequestering carbon. So if we lose seagrasses, that carbon dioxide is gonna end up in the atmosphere and may make things worse for climate change. Seagrass grows almost everywhere along the world's coastlines. So what we've done is study tiger sharks and a lot of their prey like dugongs, which are sea cows and sea turtles. And those are the big grazers on seagrass. What we found is that the tiger sharks change where these big grazers feed. And where it's really dangerous, there are lots of tiger sharks, those grazers spend almost no time there. And that kind of protects the seagrass. So we get these really big, dense forests of seagrass that provide great habitat and also sequester lots of carbon dioxide. Now, in those areas where the sharks aren't as dangerous and those big grazers spend their time, you have very little seagrass. It looks like a really closely cropped lawn, not a lot of carbon being buried, and also not a lot of place for the little fish to hide and grow up. And so what that showed us is that the tiger sharks really are controlling not just where the big grazers are spending their time, but actually the seagrass beds themselves. So what we're seeing in this one situation is that sharks are probably critical to maintaining the health of oceans. When it comes to big animals like tiger sharks, there is really no other animal that can fill their role. There's no other species out there that can threaten adult sea cows. There's no other species that can, you know, tear through a turtle shell so effectively and, and control their populations. Tiger sharks also consume garbage, including tires and license plates. 
obviously that that continues um, to talk about the fact that sharks are, are a lot of them are scavengers. I mean, they're they clean the ocean. Uh, they, they take our garbage and eat it. And they also uh, take care of fish that are uh, diseased or unhealthy. Um, and they keep those fish populations uh, healthy. So when you see a lot of sharks, uh, that's actually a good sign. That, that means that the marine ecosystem is healthy. And uh, obviously this was about seagrass when uh, in the coral reef environment, uh, Australia has seen a number of their reefs where the sharks have been overfished. And when those sharks are gone, those reef systems actually collapse. And that's a great tragedy because the coral reefs are one of the most productive areas in the ocean in terms of fish production. That's where most of the fish can congregate, can produce uh, the next generation of fish. And when that reef is gone, it's a devastating impact. Uh, again, if you'd like more detail on that issue, uh, you can obviously look look at the uh, at the book. Now, uh, the disappointing aspect when I went and, and uh, traveled to so many places around the world is that sharks are under the greatest threat they've ever faced in their 450 million year history on the planet. And primarily it's in the Pacific Ocean where they, these sharks are being uh, decimated. And one of the reasons why is something called long line fishing. And uh, this involves a single vessel setting out a line that can be as long as 100 miles. Now, I've had some uh, people tell me that the line can be even longer, it can be 150 miles. And they have baited hooks dangling from that main line. And when you put a baited hook in the water, you're going to catch um, a lot of sharks. And, and this is uh, also true for other animals. Uh, sea turtles get caught. About 300,000 sea turtles die on long line uh, vessels every year. The same thing is true for seabirds. They go for that uh, bait and uh, they get pulled under and the seabirds drown. About 300,000 seabirds also die every year. And of course, sharks get caught on these lines. And sharks die from it because sharks are what are called ram breathers. They have to keep moving to get the water over their gills to give them that oxygen. If they can't move, they can't get enough oxygen and they asphyxiate to death. And it's, uh, it's a major problem. Now, uh, I got on the uh, Greenpeace uh, ship, the Rainbow Warrior, uh, who's working to kind of stop this uh, long line fishing. And this is again, a clip from the film about long line fishing. It is a bit graphic. So just to give you a little heads up on that. The crew of the Rainbow Warrior boards a fishing vessel to inspect their records. Uh, what? Oh. The logbook really didn't line up for the amount of time that it had been at sea already, which was more than two months. Uh, yeah. I wanted to put it to be three shots. Okay. Okay. In the last printer hold we checked, we found three sets of shark fins. More than 600 different shark fins from various different species. We had to part the fins chopped off and put in a hole and the body of the shark would be dumped back overboard and often that can still be alive at that point and without its fin it's simply going to die a painful and slow death in the ocean.
all of that long line fishing that takes place around the world is one of the reasons why 100 million sharks are killed every year. And uh, the vast majority of those sharks are killed for Chinese uh, shark fin soup, about 60 million. Now, for some fish species that uh, lay, for example, eggs, which some sharks do, but mostly at live births, uh, you can't have a species survive that kind of an assault. The reproduction uh, is it takes a long time and it's something that uh, it just the, the fish cannot stand up to this kind of a fishery. And uh, when you add in shark tournaments uh, that take place here in the United States uh, and the fact that uh, sharks are caught for their products, uh, primarily squalene, uh, that, that's the material that comes out of their liver that's used for cosmetics, uh, lipstick, and you could have substitutes for that very easily. So it's a, it's a case where I think the awareness needs to rise that uh, this devastation is taking place and it's got to stop. Now, uh, now, what can you do? Now, this may have seemed a very depressing uh, presentation, but I want to leave on an upbeat note. And one of the reasons why I'm uh, having webinars like this is to raise awareness about these issues. And if you care about the oceans, and if you care about sharks, there are things that you can actually do to help. And when you go to a supermarket or you go to a restaurant, um, what you buy sends a signal to the market. So for example, when you buy a, a seafood, you wanna make sure that that seafood is sustainable. In other words, they're catching just enough so that the population is not affected. You don't want them catching uh, endangered fish. And second is that if you do like to eat tuna and Obviously, some of you uh, would like that with a, a, a tuna sandwich. You may want to consider having pole caught tuna. Now, what is that? That's simply a case where you have one fisherman with one pole catching one tuna at a time. So there's no bycatch. And it will say on the can, pole caught. So that's something to buy to know that you're not contributing to the demise of sharks. And then of course there are seals of approval on the seafood, uh, Marine Stewardship Council. When you see that, you know that that fish is uh, caught, that's uh, again, sustainable. And so beyond your seafood purchasing, you can also get involved and look at, keep up with the legislation. There is amazingly, uh, the ability to trade shark fins in the United States. Um, and there are, of course, are lots of shark fins that come into this country that again, get transferred around combined with other shark products and shipped out. Uh, we should ban this. And there is legislation at the federal level that would ban shark fin trading. And it's sitting there in Congress. So if you let your Senator or Congressperson know about this. When politicians know that you care about these issues, they're going to, I think, do something. And then of course, there are other NGOs that are out there, uh, Greenpeace, uh, Oceana, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, when you join them and get involved in their activities, you add another voice to helping to, uh, to save the oceans. And, uh, and I am uh, out there with the book and the film to, to put an end to shark tournaments and to make people aware of that they, they can have a, a very important role to play. And you can follow me on, on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. And my name is William McKeever Official and my website, williammckeever.com and the book emperorsofthedeep.com. And I would say that the book is now out hardcover and paperback with summer coming up. It's a, a great gift for someone who's interested in the ocean or, or helping in sharks. It's available in a, on, uh, on Amazon or, or in bookstores. And as I said, I, my film, full film can be seen at the International Ocean Film Festival 
uh, for the rest of, uh, of this week before the festival ends. And here's a, a picture of the book. Um, what, I, what I want to do uh, now is just uh, close with, uh, kind of give you a quick update with COVID and what that has meant to the oceans. And um, COVID um, has resulted in a reduction in fishing around the world. And that's actually been a good thing, I think, to let fish populations recover. And this happened during World War I and World War II. Fishing was dramatically cut back and we saw populations uh, return. So, uh, so that's uh, something on the positive side. But on the negative side, the shark finning and the trading, that's continuing. And the traders are using COVID and the, the, the uh, diversion of attention to that to continue to shift and, and, and to get shark fins and, and send those to, to China. Uh, just a couple of months ago, there was a seizure of 10 tons. That's incredible to think of sharks, not the bodies, just the fins. That represents about 40,000 sharks. And that was caught in a shipment of 20 tons of marijuana. So the drug dealers are involved in this and realize that they can make a very profitable business combining shipping shark fins with shipping uh, drugs. And so that's on the negative side of, of the balance sheet. And uh, again, it's something that uh, if, if we can you know, look at uh, our, our, what things we can do to help sharks, that, that would, would be great. So well, I'd like to stop there and uh, see if anyone has any questions. We fortunately have a small group, so we can uh, have a conversation. And uh, Greg, if, if you can, if you have any uh, questions in the chat box, we can certainly discuss those. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bill. That was a fascinating and um, yeah, just awe-inducing presentation. We did have a few questions in the chat already, and then if there's time after, if folks want to unmute and ask directly, you can, or just keep putting them into the chat. First one was actually from back earlier in the presentation when you were talking about shark discoveries. Uh, for new species, and um, it was asked, what is the shark named the Halloween one, the one that looked like Halloween costume? Uh, yes, that shark was um, discovered in Indonesia, and um, I, I've, I've forgotten the name, frankly. Okay. Uh, I think if you Google it, um, you, you, can, you can find it there, and um, uh, there's uh, another shark that was found uh, that's, it was called a pocket shark, that was found a couple of years ago. That, that, that you can also uh, Google. That's only uh, a few inches long and it glows. And they're very, they uh, live very uh, deep uh, in the ocean, about a thousand feet. And uh, they're not sure why they glow, but the idea is that maybe it's a way to, to, to find the mate. So we're not done finding new, new species. Um, and, uh, and it's something to, to, to follow. Uh, I'm sure there'll be another discovery later this year. Fantastic. The next question was in regards to the rates of deaths um, from shark attacks. And you had referenced something that happened in Cape Cod, but you didn't go into any details. Um, someone asked what happened in Cape Cod? Yes, yeah, so uh, Cape Cod is a very popular destination. And um, for years, the, there were no great whites. And now that the seals have recovered because they are under federal protection. We've seen the seal population go from virtually nothing to over 300,000. And so the great whites are, are coming in uh, solely for, for the seals. And um, there was a, a swimmer who was a bit offshore and it was an unfortunate situation, wrong place, wrong time. And there was a death in the town of Truro in Cape Cod uh, and that was in uh, 20, uh, nine, let's see, 2019. Um, now, the, the, the towns on the Cape are obviously wanting to prevent that again. And so they have a lot of warnings and uh, there's a lot of news about, you know, don't swim too far out and, uh, and, and be careful. And I think those are all productive, but at the same time, you know, we, we want to be uh, recognized that 
you know, we, we can share the ocean with, with sharks and great whites are, are part of the ecosystem. Uh, we don't want to call them, we don't want to call the seals either. We want to take a rational approach and the Cape is looking at uh, ways to control um, the, the interaction. Uh, drones is on the, the list of things that they're looking at. And, and, and I think that with these kinds of efforts that we can prevent uh, deaths in the future. Fantastic. <clears throat> Next question, it's a slightly different angle from what you've presented on. Is it true that the shark is attracted to blood? Women worry about this during their cycle if they want to swim in states like Florida or Hawaii. I suspect this might be a myth. Uh, that's a great question. And uh, sharks are attracted to blood. Um, I mean, they, they are looking for animals that have been wounded. Uh, people who catch a fish, throw it back, and maybe bleeding from the encounter. Uh, that's definitely gonna get a shark's attention. Now, for uh, for people, if you have a, a cut on your on your hand or um, something similar, um, there's not enough blood in, in the water that would be able to disperse far enough to get the attention of a shark. That that blood has to travel a distance and then find and, and, and literally find the shark. So I think it's very safe to go. Swimming and and uh, and and again, just be sure that you're in in water that's within where the waves are breaking. Sharks do not like to hang around sandbars and where the waves are breaking because they can get caught in those waves and they can get washed up on the beach or on a sandbar and that will kill them. So they they tend to stay away. So if you're in that just off the beach. Uh, and as of course, it's common sense. If you're not bleeding profusely, um, the chances are that 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, things will be fine. Great, thank you. Next question was about um, the sea snake wetsuits, and someone asked, "Can they make the surfboards look like sea snakes too?" Uh, that's a great idea, um, and uh, you may have discovered a business. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, that, that could very well work. Um, I frankly have never heard anybody take that approach. There are some people who, who've gone uh, with another approach, which is that uh, they put an, a, a very uh, disturbing electrical signal on the ankle of the surfer. So the concept is that when the shark comes up, they will be uh, deterred when they sense that very high electrical uh, frequency. Uh, does that work? Uh, it's too early to say. I'm not sure that it will, frankly. I think right now the, the sea snake suit, but you, you've come up with an idea that's, that's very intriguing. Great, thanks. Um, next question is how and why are rain and tiger sharks, sharks connected? You had that on a slide, but you didn't go into it. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, so Australia did a study um, and they wanted to say, uh, understand how do we actually prevent shark attacks? How do we be proactive? So this study came out and, and you can see it online. And one of the things that they realized was that when it rained a lot, there were shark attacks afterwards. And of course the question is, well, why? And as you can expect, when it rains a lot on land that, there's a lot of sediment that gets washed into the streams, it gets into the rivers, and then those rivers deposit that sediment in the ocean. So around those places, the water gets very murky and, and uh, cloudy. And it's difficult for a shark then to distinguish its prey. So what would happen after the rain, uh, the water was cloudy and there, was, uh, there were more shark encounters. So you don't want to go in the ocean, or particularly where there's a river, uh, after, after there's rain. It, stay away from, the, from those areas. And uh, uh, an, an, an interesting uh, conclusion. Now, I, there were other um, things that came out of that that don't, don't have time uh, to, to go into them. But I think, again, science is learning a lot more of how we can, we can share the ocean with sharks and take a rational view. 
Fantastic. A couple more in the chat, and then we'll open it up to the mics. Um, are there any health issues or trends with sharks due to pollution in the oceans? Yes, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the sharks are, you know, going to have to, to struggle with this ocean acidification that I mentioned. It's probably only going to get worse. Uh, the oceans have absorbed, uh, that, hold me this, just doing this from memory, approximately 60% of the carbon that we have emitted into the atmosphere. If it wasn't for the oceans, it would be a lot hotter than it is now. Uh, the oceans worldwide have seen an increase in temperature of about you know, one and a half degrees, almost two degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, while that may not seem like a lot, um, it, again, that's an average. So some areas are seeing increases in temperature much more than that. The Gulf of Mexico is, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Gulf of Maine uh, is the fastest warming body of water on earth. That's, that temperature is up 10 degrees. And of course, we know what's happening at the polar ex extremes. So those changes in temperature um, are really problematic for sharks because each species likes a particular temperature. Bull sharks, for example, like around, like, like I do, 70, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, some sharks like the water uh, very cold, uh, like the Greenland shark. Uh, if the temperature gets too warm, they, they will literally kill them. So this, this temperature change and, the, and of course the pollution that, that's added and, and uh, not just the dirty pollution, but things like uh, fishing gear. Uh, there's a lot of fishing gear that gets lost in the ocean and it doesn't just sink to the bottom and disappear. That fishing gear is floating and catching fish continuously. These nets that are out there are like ghost nets and fish swim into them and die. And it, and it just keeps on going as long as that fishing gear is out there. So that's very significant. Um, one last thing I, I wanna mention is the pollution from plastic. And uh, that's uh, obviously a major problem, uh, partly because of the impact it has on the, the ocean uh, food pyramid. So when plastic gets into the ocean, the plastic breaks down into microparticles and then nanoparticles. And the small fish are attracted to that because algae grows on the surface of so those little plastic bits. So those little fish are ingesting those plastic and, and getting the leaching of, off of the plastic into their tissues. And of course, bigger fish come along, eat those and so forth along up the pyramid. So sharks being at the top of the pyramid, it's called biomagnification. Those, those uh, things in the water, the mercury, the plastic, the leachates are getting into the shark flesh at a much greater rate than it is at, with fish and the lower end of the food chain. So actually you don't wanna eat shark. Um, it's very rare for people to eat shark, but some people will eat makos, but that's a, that's a bad idea because you'll get a, a lot of mercury. So uh, I've actually touched on a lot, a lot of different things. So to very quickly sum up, plastic is a major problem. And when we eat fish, we have to give a second thought, is that plastic getting in, into us? And then of course, these other issues about ocean acidification um, are real risks. I think that we are at a moment in history where we need to act as a society, because if this continues at this rate over the next decade, it will be too late. It's not too late now. We can turn this around. Wow, that was really fascinating. Um, Biomagnification, that's crazy. Magnetization. Um, one more question in the chat, Bill, and then we'll open it up to see if there's any last minute ones. I know we're at the hour, but I think this is really great and we still have some folks in the, in the audience. Um, what is your favorite kind of shark and could you tell us a little about it? Yeah, um, I, I love that question. There's, there's so many uh, great ones out there. I love the tiger shark because the, those beautiful, it's born with very uh, dark stripes, like, like a tiger, and that's how it got its name. Then as it gets older, it, it tends to, to, to fade. Uh, but they are, uh, they are big, tough, uh, strong animals, and, uh, and yet they're scavengers. 
Uh, I find it fascinating that scientists uh, would open them up, uh, unfortunately, but they would find contents in their stomach like license plates. Um, they would find um, uh, tires, uh, all kinds of garbage that, that we throw. And they eat that uh, to clean the ocean for us. They also will uh, feed on carcasses of uh, whales. Uh, so they do us all a, a, you know, a great service. And, and I think we, you know, they're, they're big and, and beefy and, and um, I think you're putting it all together. It's, it's one of the biggest sharks out there. And it's one that I just a, a admire to a great deal. Lovely. Okay, anyone want to unmute and ask a last minute question before we close the event? Or if you have anything in it that you'd like to add to the chat, give a few seconds. Don't be afraid, don't be shy. Barbara? I just got me thinking now, um, what is the shark on the cover of the book? Uh, oh, this, uh, so Emperors of the Deep, the book that, that, that you see here, uh, this is the, a tale of, uh, of a Mako shark. Uh, and, and this is the fastest shark in the ocean. It goes about 45 miles an hour. And you can see the tail, the top part is equal in length to the bottom part. That's the most efficient tail you can have if you are any kind of fish. So they're, they're designed for speed and um, uh, just remarkable. So all these great statistics uh, and facts about sharks are, are in the book on the Makos and, and hammerheads, et cetera. So I'll, I'll make a, a, a shameless plug if you, you know, this summer, if you have uh, somebody's birthday is coming up and uh, I think it makes a great gift and, and people that go on vacation to the beach somewhere, it's, it's good to read and will actually calm them and make them want to go in the ocean and, and enjoy it. So uh, thank you, Barbara, for mentioning the, the cover of the book. It's, it's one that's different. Most of the books have the teeth, uh, you know, showing and, and that's just <laughs> creating the, the wrong kind of view. Yeah, the other end, much, much more dramatic <laughs> or yeah. beautiful. Thank you very much. I enjoyed all this information. Appreciate it. You're welcome. My pleasure. All right. Any other final questions tonight? And while you're thinking of unmuting, I did throw the link one more time to emperorsofthedeep.com. All right. I don't see anyone unmuting or uh, entering other questions into the chat. So Bill, on behalf of the library and the college, thank you so much for being here. Thank you everyone for participating and being a great audience. And um, if you are viewing this recording, thank you for viewing the recording. The recording will be made available soon after the live presentation. We'll throw it up on uh, YouTube. So it'll be available to the public and we'll share widely. So thanks so much, Bill. Great. Well, thank you, Craig, for having me and everyone. Uh, thank you for participating. And uh, again, uh, follow me on Facebook and uh, I hope we can do maybe a follow-up, uh, something like this, uh, not too distant future. So thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.